Stephen. Andrew. Fancy spending a quiet night inside number nine? Of course. Right, we're um, heading into the script book again. This week we're looking at Empty Orchestra. Um, And as with previous episodes when we're doing this, um, we kind of recommend probably going and listening to our original uh, reaction before listening to this because we'll likely not cover the ground that we, or much of the ground that we covered in the original one, um, and we'll assume knowledge. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> never assume knowledge yeah so we this is this is kind of uh we, we look through the book uh see you know what's different between the script and what we see in the final uh product on screen and just have a little bit of a chat around that i i mean with this one i did I, there wasn't a huge amount of stuff that i noticed was different it was a little bit difficult to to keep up at times where you've got, you know, you've got the sort of lyrics of the songs um, going and then there's like moments of lip reading or um, like dialogue going on separate mm-hmm. to that, but it's not, obviously not side by side in the script. So it's quite difficult to, to kind of read along, I found. I don't know about you. Yeah, I, f- I found it interesting that the lyrics are all printed <laughs> in <Yeah>. here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> As though it's like, no, you you need to know what's being sung here. It's not that they're just singing along to Do You Want Me Baby. These are the words they are singing. And I guess that's partly down to the fact that the songs are all supposed to kind of weave into what's the going on quite nicely. The, yeah, yeah. And I think they do, actually. That, that was one thing that I noticed even more than before. Mm. Just actually like, yeah, this is these are very carefully selected songs yeah. and i was actually thinking so earlier this week went to see um annette um at the cinema which is a uh, a musical and i was thinking oh there aren't any um inside number nine like musicals yeah i wonder if they'll have a go at that and then i watched this again and i was like this is actually the closest thing i think it probably is yeah the, i think it's the closest it will ever get they're yeah. not gonna have like a buffy the vampire slayer <laughs> Well, out I, did, singing episode, you think? I don't know. There's there's other things you potentially wouldn't imagine them having a try well, at. But I guess Zanzibar is getting there just without music, <laughs> with yeah. the rhythm and the yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I'd, <laughs> I would love to see it. I'd love to see Steve and Reese kind of really hamming up all the out musical, musical theatre. Yeah, yeah. It would be like the producers, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> something along those lines, or all out Gilbert and Sullivan, HMS <laughs> Pinnacle. <laughs> I'm, uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, we'll see. I'm, I'm sure it's coming. Series seven, place your bets now. <laughs> um, yeah, what are your sort of, what was your kind of overriding thoughts? I... What were your overriding thoughts? This was the first time I've watched it with headphones on this morning. And that made a big difference. Made a difference to the extent that I had goosebumps at the end in the, um, with titanium and the ending. Mm. That was ridiculous. And I don't know if it was because of thumping bass in my headphones, but yeah, it was I mean, yeah. really great. That track um, is supposed to be enjoyed through good sort of sound de- de- delivery i think yeah <laughs> that's yeah. that's where these these headphones were worth every penny i paid for them. just for titanium <laughs> this podcast is sponsored by sennheiser um one thing i did notice that isn't in the book and actually ends up being quite powerful is janet's relationship with sound mm-hmm. and it's all direction right all sort of during filming direction i think rather than scripted there isn't yep. really mention of her touching the speakers and being able to kind of tune in and out with things mm. and i think that makes a really powerful part of the story that isn't in the scripts at all and especially when you get to that final scene with um her and Dwayne's heartbeat that's such a big deal that moment yeah. at the very end that isn't in any of it it's not it doesn't seem to have been written at all mm-hmm. 
but that's kind of what she's all about. Yeah. I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. No, I noticed that. And like when she, um, listens to, it's the, um, the wham rap, isn't it? When he's, um, and she's kind of puts her hand to the speaker and mm. can, can actually, you, you kind of, and you experience it through her, um, through her sensory experience as well. Like yeah, the way that they do the sound and everything, which, yeah, like there's, n- there's no direction, um, in the, uh, <laughs> uh, <What? laughs> I don't know. I'm just got com- like, is that sort of a one direction tribute? Act? I did one do it. That way. <laughs> <laughs> I almost saw that thought go through your head. I was just imagining the people in that band. Who, who are they? <laughs> no direction. <laughs> no direction. What is the opposite of the members of One Direction? <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> something to think about. It's something to think about. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, no direction in the in the book as to any of that stuff. So yeah, that I wonder at what point whether that was like a GM because it's GM directs this one, I think. Or I think it, so as yeah, well. I think it is. Whether it was a, as they were filming, oh, this, this could work. Um, is there was a few minor changes through, through things where you could tell like this is, they're just sort of adapting to how things are on set. I mean, I wonder, that was massive. That was, it's a really significant part. I wonder to what extent Emily Howlett had a part in that because I know she's quite vocal about her experience as a deaf person in the, um, in the arts community and those Mm. sorts of things. And I do wonder whether it was a case of, is it worth trying to get across to the viewer that kind of empathic thing of you experiencing that like she does yeah, and how, and how it is for her and that adding something to the experience. Yeah. Um, and yeah, quite possibly. Yeah. And maybe that like, maybe it was something that they had kind of bubbling as, as a concept, but didn't want to necessarily put it in the script. Like I'd, it's almost one of those things that you would, you would want to explore with somebody who actually experiences the world like that before you assume anything, um, or sort of, you know, write it, write an experience, put words into someone's mouth or yeah. whatever. Um, and, and so maybe that was something that they were like, Oh, I wonder how we can convey that or, or create that. Um, and, and at what point that happened in the process, but yeah, I'm, I know Emily is yeah. Massively sort of kind of into like developing that sort of stuff. And it's really, really helpful. Like I found, I find it really, really helpful part of the production of that episode in terms of like that, as you say, the empathic being able to, to feel and experience it as it would be like the kind of alienating aspects of it, but also the, the way that you can experience it and enjoy it. And that comes through as well. Like, yeah. So I always, I always find it, um, crazy how we I, when when i'm at work teaching and we have students who have um cochlear implants and we have like a little thing to wear sometimes mm-hmm. when we're teaching them and there's i think there's kind of this misconception that that's just a microphone for us to wear that um will allow them to hear exactly what we're saying clear as day and actually it's it's a real mess it's a sensory overload of just sound where you're just giving a little bit more of an opportunity for them to pick out something Mm -hmm. and in reality it's incredible that they managed to kind of pull out of that yeah what 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 they managed to pull out because yeah i feel Mm. like i'll be on a hiding to nothing with that Mm. and i know that um i think we spoke about the um first time round about the work that Emily also put into training herself to sing. And I, and I think it kind of plays into this idea that she was actually 
quite a big part of this production and she said that she didn't feel at any point that she was sort of like a token deaf person mm -hmm. who was brought in just to fill a role um and so actually yeah it would make sense that she might have been having a hand in that kind of direction yeah yeah that makes sense um yeah uh, was there anything else you uh, the, the picked out the I suppose it's the second reference to the countdown conundrum in Inside yeah. Number Nine that was cut out. I think um, I didn't notice that it was left in at any Connie, point. No, Connie, um, Connie, not a fan of countdown. Isn't aware of countdown. She's never <laughs> seen countdown. It. She's never seen. Countdown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was in reference to the uh, the cunt grot. How are the, how do they pronounce it? Congratulations. Cunt Grottolation. No, because there's next. How many Cunt Grottolation? Cunt Grottolation. Cunt Grot. I don't know. Connie says it in a way that's like, ah, oh, yes, that that sounds like how you're pr supposed to pronounce it. Cunt, gro Cunt Grottolations. Mm. <laughs> Is yeah. that a spell anyway? <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> um, yeah, I've forgotten quite how vile Connie is to Janet. It's absolutely horrific. Mm. She's a real, real nasty piece of work. Um, Tamsin Althway does it very, very well. She is absolutely deplorable. Yeah. She also um, is quite good at um, seemingly ad-libbing fake fellatio because <laughs> that's not in the script. I made a note of that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you're holding a microphone, what else are you going to do? do you think? <laughs> Yeah, I was surprised not to see that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting booked for many. Uh... <laughs> it's repeat bookings I struggle with. <laughs> <laughs> you thought I could get my foot in the door and just push on, but no. No, apparently not. <laughs> so I've got my wedding act like down to a T, but apparently not. <laughs> um, yeah, I was expecting to see that in the script. Yeah, uh, well, I was. Turn that page. Nope. <laughs> no. I wonder whose idea that was. Hers. <laughs> yeah, because it would be a bit of a bold sort of, uh, Tom's in, well, any chance you could? Yeah. <laughs> well, having said that, there was um, another um, phallic line that I, I'm going to guess that Steve wrote in, <laughs> talking about his powerful erection. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> It's um, stabbing. Mm -hmm. You're stabbing me, wasn't it? There, there was a couple of. Uh, is that when she was she was dancing with him? Yeah, yeah. And then um, Dw Dwayne notices it as well, doesn't he? Yes. <laughs> he comes back in. <laughs> but, I want to. There we go. Connie tries to move away from Roger's powerful erection. <laughs> <laughs> Steve's Unne that. Unnecessary adjectives in there from Steve. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Steve, do um, we need it? Do we need it to say powerful? <laughs> no, I just imagine that's what it would be. <laughs> that's what I've been told it is. That's just what I imagine it would be. <laughs> <laughs> it's my white snake. Yeah, and that there you go. Like, there we go. That was an incredible segue. Thank you. <laughs> um, that works on levels. <laughs> it does. Neil Sadaka definitely does. Neil Sadaka doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, there was the um, so the White Snake switched out with the Neil Sedaka, and then later on, I've been White Snake Neil Sedaka switch so much better. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe they'll like a bit of White Snake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's not just um, that's not Gary Baldy specific because <laughs> I think actually the Neil Sedaka is potentially a better um, uh, like specific reference. But White Snake is a more rounded, multi leveled. <laughs> rounded, multi leveled White Snake. <laughs> I think also the fact that he's just um, got up and sung a load of Rainbow suggests yeah, that a, he's, he's a, kind of exists in that kind of 70s hard rock thing that yeah. Neil Sadaka doesn't really occupy. <laughs> yeah. Particularly. Very much so. Yeah. Um, and oh, that Brummy accent. His oh, it's brummy. amazing. And, uh, see, it's that thing that when you sing 
people often lose their accent, don't they? Because you're moving your mouth in different ways, and so you lose the accent. But he certainly does not <laughs> lose the accent. No. And that's the th- we, we've spoken a lot about them being very good at bringing out people acting badly, mm-hmm. bad acting. I don't know. I honestly could not tell you whether any of these people can actually sing because their bad singing is so good as bad singing. Yes. But I know so I mean, the num- the proportion of actors that can also sing because they are generally that kind of triple th- threat thing of singing, dancing, acting. They, they go to acting school. They learn to sing. They learn to do all those things. Mm-hmm. So there will be a few people in this group that can actually sing. Yeah. But it's just so bad. Yeah. <laughs> Saturday yeah. night. Saturday night. <laughs> I know it's so the, horrible. <laughs> she, she said the uh, bit limited these lyrics, aren't they, earlier than it is in the script. I think they sort of wanted to address All that. Of it. Enough. <laughs> Enough. Yeah. That's the thing. Saturday night is not a karaoke song. There is nothing no. about that that is a karaoke song. It's one of those horrible, creepy, coordinated dance move songs that everyone knows. And just strikes fear into me when I see a room full of people doing the exact same dance moves that have just seeped into collective okay. consciousness. Automatons. Yeah. It's horrible. I hate yeah. it. That, the cha-cha slide. Oh, yes. <laughs> Maybe even Superman. Not Superman. <laughs> no, not now we know that. No. So, Superman hold a special place in your heart now. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, Fran post the Saturday night song says, I smell like a meat pie. Yeah. Is that a <laughs> reference to a, is that like a thing or is I don't really just know. pretty grim <laughs> sweaty meat is a horrible thing to say. <laughs> Quite visceral. Is it, it yeah. It's, yeah. It's like, I don't want to be near Fran right now. I smell like a meat pie. <laughs> like a meat pie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if there's another level to that reference, whether yeah. maybe she's um i noticed that the direction why is page 120 when she sees the message that connie's sending from Dwayne's phone mm-hmm. it says that she looks shocked um i didn't think she looked that shocked i think she looked more just kind of this is typical connie behavior <laughs> yeah yeah i don't think she it was kind of, this is typical Connie behavior and I'm a bit passive and not going to yeah. actually do anything about it. Cause yeah, that's what I felt w- watching it was like, she, she's got an opportunity to maybe call that out, which would be probably appropriate. But yeah, I noticed that Fran reads it and is shocked. Um, the other thing about that is potentially a bit dated in terms of like you wouldn't be able to send a message from someone else's phone now very easily because of passcode lock yeah and like they used to be able to lock your phone with a pin didn't you you did yeah and it was really hard work if you entered it wrong too many times to get back in because it locked the sim yes and you had to get the whole thing unlocked and it was a nightmare Mm -hmm. (laughs) all these problems i don't think i ever did that but I, no, I don't know why I know that. I don't think I did either. Because you but were trying I, to get no, into it was other a, people's phones. Maybe that was just it. knocking people's <laughs> phones. Yeah. It was when I was, it was that period I had of fencing stolen Nokia 3310s <laughs> for a while. <laughs> yes. Um, another weird Fran thing was when they start singing, I know him so well. Um, or Fran singing it. Mm-hmm. And then it's kind of made out that Connie's just kind of brought herself into that song, which would make, which I think kind of makes a little more sense than what actually happens, which is Fran kind of beckons her to come in and get involved. <laughs> I guess Fran just likes a good duet. <laughs> yeah. And she's not in, aware of. Has no reason to think um, Connie is. Anything but just a bit of a... And in reality, she's just completely besotted with Greg. Which is really still quite... 
bizarre. I'm not, I'm not falling into this trap again. I'm not <laughs> falling into this trap of saying there's anything positive about Greg. <laughs> He's a deplorable we, human being, isn't he? The we've worst. seen him in a uh, in a sumo outfit, and no, I think I I to think he there isn't much redeeming about Greg, other than the he, fact he looks like Reese Shearsmith. <laughs> <laughs> And that guy who did Gangnam Style. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact that there's just a guy in a fancy dress shop who's just gone, oh, so just bob him off with this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I would have know. preferred him in um, the full Madonna get up, Reese Shearsmith with pointy bra <laughs> and a that, wig. That the fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> that is it. That is it. Some people listening right now have are now going with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the uh, so what the, the other thing going back to Steve's erection, <laughs> <laughs> mate, move on, move on from Steve's <laughs> erection. I'm trying to find, I'm trying to find Steve's erection. Where's the powerful? <laughs> da, 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 da. So it's just before um like it's just before I know him so well. Okay. Um but study on Roger, you're stabbing me a little bit. <laughs> so what, just after he's sung, is it? Or is it before? Yeah, just after he, so he, yes, with um, so when Dwayne comes in and says, "I, I tripod alert," <laughs> Dwayne nods towards Roger, and then there's the direction we see that he is singing with a large erection in his trousers, <laughs> which again, <laughs> <laughs> Steve's obviously put added the word large there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of my favourite. Favorite like stage directions. <laughs> we see that he is singing with a large erection in his trousers. <laughs> it's a delight to read. Steve. <laughs> oh yeah, there's we know where the tries to move away from Roger's powerful erection. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, he's, he's not letting the. Uh, it's like a dog with a bone. Not that loud. <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> uh, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, again, because I've, I've been trying to work out my thoughts on this episode again. Like, I know I talked when we first watched it. Like, I, I, d I do find it, I find it quite a grim episode. I know it's like a happy ending and... It's one um, of the happiest endings. Yeah, but I find it just a <laughs> for <bleak>. Roger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> With the hens, I like um, that she's got a name, Chantel. Yeah, Chantel. Chantel. Chantel Lovely. won't tell. <laughs> um. Yeah, and the um, <laughs> that there's a direction at the end which says Roger is dancing with the hens. <laughs> <laughs> like if you've not watched it and you've just sort of oh flick you're just flicking what? through the, he's, he's dancing, dancing with, the hens. with hens <laughs> <laughs> what's this episode yeah but no I, I i just find it and i think it's it's for for many of the reasons we've talked about like and it's claustrophobic it's it's quite sensorily like in your face difficult to sort of get a um hold on what is going on because there's a, a lot of noise um which again is probably working on a few levels in terms mm -hmm. of the um the kind of janet aspect and and yeah as you say the bad singing the the fact that it's like no i do i know this work um this this kind of work night out and it's one where you wake up the next day feeling like a bit grim. It's the, <laughs> I guess in some respects there's 
kind of quite close ties to those same feelings you get when you're watching The Office and you mm. see those relationships playing out and you you cringe and you feel uncomfortable because you know these people. Yeah. You know what those people are like in an office environment and you know the way they get tied up in each other's lives. And yeah, it's that. Mm. It's that that it's too close. Thing. Yeah. It is. It's too close to home. Exactly that. It's what that's what the British office did that the US office wasn't. That's the US mm -hmm. office just didn't do that at all. And it, it's a it's an amazing piece of work for for other completely different reasons. Yeah. But that's what the British office did was that it was just yeah, you know these people and yeah. you know what how they act and you know it's the cool. conversations that go on. It smells like a meat pie. It smells like a meat pie, exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a, the bit that was cut, interestingly, and I'm glad it was, was after the the kind of incident with um Janet singing and then it being revealed that um Connie had sent the message and everything. It's like kicking off. And um and Roger says, All right, everyone, can I just have a word um before things get too heated? You're all right, Janet. And then oh, yeah. obviously she's not. Um and then he turns to Connie and says, that wasn't nice, Connie, but we're out of office hours, so I'm going to draw a line under it. Um, and then Connie says, oh, yeah, we all know she's got you wrapped around her little, little finger. finger. Um, and so that, like, we're out of the office, we're out of office hours, I'm going to draw a line under it, it was cut, and then that Connie line. Um, cause, and I thought, yeah, that doesn't seem like Roger... Although he has sort of, he's kind of glossed over it. Maybe he's drawn a line under it. Like that's been maybe implicitly um, conveyed, but then it's, that's probably more because he's not really thinking about that. He's thinking about, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, his divorce, the fact he's quitting his job and is passing it, passing his job on to Frank. all of these relationships are now out of office. <laughs> yes. He's not yes, bearing. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, th I thought that that seemed out from what you know about Roger, it seemed out of character to just be like, yeah, that's, you know, that bullying that has just happened. Yeah. We'll draw a line. And it's like, it's not your thing to draw a line under Roger, I'm afraid. Like, even if, <laughs> yeah, even if you are out of office hours, it's like. These aren't your people. If you're out of office hours, these aren't your people to deal with <laughs> really either. <laughs> no. And the only person that can draw a line is. Um, Janet. Janet, yeah. Like, that's the, yeah, it's not your line to draw. <laughs> so, no, I'm glad that was dropped. Yeah. Mm. I really like it. You do, good. I do. I, I like how the music works. I like that there's that little nod right at the beginning of an exasperated Roger saying, it's not just one song after another, is it? Yeah. Um, which is preempting straight away. <laughs> yeah, how you how you may end up feeling about this. Yeah, um, and they do that quite well. Those knowing little things, those yeah. knowing little lines that are kind of preempting what you're going to think about this. Yeah, a lot. And like, then the answer is Heights. yes. Yes, it is. It's very much going to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I, it's it's an episode that I I really appreciate and think is great in terms of the way it's it's it just doesn't make it doesn't leave me feeling clean <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure which episodes of inside number one inside number, number one, one. <laughs> <laughs> wow well. Oh, Email good. us at uh, quite a night inside no one. Uh, gmail. No one. <laughs> inside no one. <laughs> wow, um, a quite night into no. Let's stop right there. <laughs> I swear you need a psychoanalyst to come along and tell me what, what that slip no what one. was that slip about? <laughs> inside no one. <laughs> um Email us with your thoughts. <laughs> interpret that slip. <laughs> At Aquatic Night Inside No Nine at gmail dot com or on Twitter at AQNIN9. Next time 
we're into diddle diddle dumpling. Mm. Does that leave you feeling clean? Um, no. <laughs> not particularly. No, that's what I was going to say. Like, I, I don't know which episodes of uh, Inside Number Nine do leave me feeling clean. Um, but whether it, it's kind of a, a neutral, just sort of normal grubbiness versus feeling unclean. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe n- nothing makes me feel particularly clean. What's the difference between grubby and unclean? Email us your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> this has turned into like a mid-morning matters Alan Partridge episode. <laughs> I just mean sort of general, you know, once you, uh, sort of an hour or two after you've had your shower, you have a general sort of grubbiness about you, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Depends what I'm doing. <laughs> If I'm heading down the mines, <laughs> probably. Uh, yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> you ruminate on that. Yeah. And we'll um, see you in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah. Have a good couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> fortnight. Yeah, fortnight. <laughs> see you. Bye. 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 <laughs>